Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Global Supply Chain Week. Uh, I'm Greg Miller, Senior Editor with Freight Waves and American Shipper. Uh, and I'm here for a fireside chat with Evan Estatiu, uh, the founder of SkySail Advisors in Boston and the CEO of Bremerstern Vogel. Evan, it's always great to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Greg. Great to be here. Yeah, to, so today Evan and I are going to talk about uh, VC-backed uh, funding for tech startups and maritime. Uh, there is a lot of excitement around this right now. Uh, but before we do that, uh, Evan, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, SkySail Advisors and Burmester and Vogel? Thank you, Greg. Uh, my name is Evan F. Stathew. I'm the founder and CEO of SkySail Advisors, a maritime advisory company I founded in 2015 that focuses on M&A advisory, strategy consulting, and maritime data and analytics for companies involved in bulk transportation of dry bulk, uh, liquid bulk, such as oil and natural gas, as well as containers. Uh, in 2019, I founded Burmester and Vogel Limited and raised a Series A venture capital raise to launch a freight technology platform built on the proven technology underpinned by the BNV Laytime Calculator. Our software is used by hundreds of companies around the world to calculate the delay associated with uh, ships when they're loading and discharging cargo. Uh, presently, we have hundreds of millions of tons a year that are processed uh, using our calculator to help companies spend less time during their cargo operations. Okay, great. So. Uh, maritime tech startups. Uh, this is a subject that Evan and I have talked about many times through the years uh, for articles uh, published in Freight Waves and American Shipper. I specifically recall writing an article back in the first half of 2019 with a headline of something like, uh, this is the time for maritime tech. Um, there was a big Series A funding round for a company called Nautilus Labs. Uh, and maybe I was premature, um, but um, but maybe this is the time in, in 2021. And there's a couple of different ways to look at this topic. Uh, there's the sort of push side of it, which is the funding from the VCs uh, and the interest in the startup entrepreneurs uh, in getting involved in uh, the maritime side for the first time. Uh, and there's also the pull side, uh, the pull aspect, uh, the interest in ship owners and shipping companies uh, in partnering with maritime tech startups uh, or at least giving their products a trial run. So, so let's start with the push side, um, the, the funding side. Uh, to go back to 2019, as I was saying, in the first half, uh, there was a lot of excitement. And then uh, in the second half of 2019, we had the, the WeWork fiasco and sort of a refocus by the VCs on uh, profitability of startups. Uh, and then, uh, in the, of course, in the first half of 2020, we had COVID and you know, the world was coming to an end. Uh, everything sort of stopped. There was a bit of a pause as uh, you know, the VC companies and the entrepreneurs and frankly, the shipping companies were waiting to see what's next. And then the second half of 2020, we saw this real acceleration uh, of interest in tech and tech startups. And that's continuing into, uh, to, into this year. Uh, so with that sort of backdrop, Evan, if you could just uh, give us your view, uh, st sticking now with the push side, with the funding side and the entrepreneur side, how do you see the landscape uh, for the, the maritime space? Well, certainly, Greg, I don't think you were very far off uh, with your view in 2019. If you look at uh, technology across all industries, and I mean going beyond uh, freight technology, what typically has happened over the decades is that you'll have moments where technology shifts happen in waves uh, within an industry where you see a, a, a surge in both adoption as well as in uh, capital coming in to support the development of both new and evolution of established players. So I believe that that pace for maritime tech uh, had been building up really from the period 2016 to 2019. We started to see more and more very small scale uh, fundings happening, some M&A happen, although nothing really on the radar of other tech industries. And with 2019, we had regulatory uncertainty coming up 
that really helped create opportunities uh, for companies to uh, look at how to change their operations. I think what we did see with 2020 and COVID was that you had a, a dual disruption of uh, COVID forcing a change in the way people work, in where people are when they're working. Uh, and, uh, and I think that those disruptive moments tend to be ones where uh, capital likes to jump in and, uh, and, and seek early opportunities. Yeah, and also uh, sticking with the funding side and the entrepreneur side, um, you know, in a way, uh, you know, there are, there are certainly players that have gotten into the space, but but maritime is is you know somewhat of an empty space at least compared to other industries in the world, uh, and I, you know I would also say that um, you know if you look at the news these days, uh, look at the container industry; it's all over the news. You got this congestion in Los Angeles and Long Beach. Uh, you've got this huge import demand, this big focus on the cost of goods. And so uh, you know, I would think uh, from the perspective of someone on the funding side or someone on the startup side, uh, they would look at this space and say, um, you know, first off, uh, you know, it's relatively uncrowded. And second of all, they see these problems and would say, well, how can we make some money fixing that? You're absolutely right. I, I think that... Uh two sides to that coin. One is that uh, shipping, as we call it, shipping, really bulk transportation uh, is responsible for moving anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of global trade. And it's largely been a, a kind of hidden industry where even though it's around us, we often don't think about it. We don't see it. These giant ships of the sea, many of them three football fields long, are moving goods day and night. Um, uh, historically, you'd hear about shipping when bad things happen, such as oil spills. Whereas now, when we've had disruptions in the supply chain, we become, uh, we start to realize that uh, oil tankers are moving oil. Sometimes they're being used for storage of oil, as we saw last year uh, during COVID. Uh, uh, similarly, container ships are responsible for moving so many goods around the world. What does that mean for the funding side? Well, I think that when we saw some big funding movements happening with Flexport on the freight forwarding side um, and a big influx of investment into trucking freight tech, including electronic driver logging and these segments, which have raised literally hundreds of millions of dollars, that's when venture capital and private equity looked and said, well, what other areas of transportation have yet to fully digitalize where there's a, a nascent opportunity. And uh, similarly, the number of players in maritime tech, the scale of these players being generally on the smaller side, it, it really provides for an interesting dynamic in terms of you're in a niche market that requires expertise in the business processes and, uh, and, and workflows. So a tech company that comes out with good innovation can really capture a lot of the market and, uh, and keep those customers. So it's a really exciting dynamic, according to many of the investors that have explored and come into the market. And I guess one uh, sort of way to gauge that interest would be valuations. Uh, and I'm wondering if, uh, you know, what you're seeing out there, I mean, obviously the valuations uh, of uh, tech companies in general uh, have, have have increased uh, over the recent months, but I'm wondering what you're seeing on the valuations on maritime tech and maybe what that says about uh, interest in the sector right now. Well, we've been pretty surprised by what we've seen, uh, surprised in a good way about some of the valuations. Uh, uh, the valuations we've seen for recent investments suggest that uh, investors are really looking beyond what is a company currently making, but really what is the way that the addressable market is growing and possibilities for capturing that market. Uh, when you consider that a ship easily costs tens of millions of dollars and freight rates are in the tens of thousands of dollars per day, uh, fuel consumption in the, in the tens of thousands of dollars per day in some cases, uh, starting to find ways to optimize those assets by by one percent or even a tenth of a percent on a fleet of from a handful of ships to hundreds of vessels, all of a sudden you're talking huge economics. So I think that uh, a lot of that valuation has been driven by uh, excitement for the possibility of a growing market 
and also the realization that in maritime tech, I think once you've acquired the customer, uh, it's you really have a long lifetime with that customer. Companies in the industry uh, tend to uh, use their vendors, stick with their vendors, work with their vendors. Uh, so you have a stickiness factor that's very attractive uh, in addition to the fact that there aren't really so many players in the space. Okay, let's turn to the, the pull side of the equation, the interest in shipping and, and doing business with tech startups. I mean, my personal opinion is that uh, his, historically uh, shipping has been slow in tech adoption. And one of my ideas is that, you know, particularly on the bulk shipping side, the commodity shipping side, the customers, the charters, you know, what they really want is inexpensive transport that does what it needs to do. It gets to, from point A to point B when it's supposed to, it doesn't sink. And, uh, you know, for the last, you know, decades, what's happened is that the shipping industry uh, has overbuilt. There's always, there's always been overcapacity. There's always been too many ships. So from the charter's perspective, uh, you know, they have all the ships they need and they can be low tech and they can still perform the function uh, that they need. So that's one reason I think that maybe it hasn't been adopted that quickly in my view. But now we have all these external drivers that are changing the minds of people on the shipping side. You have, you have ESG, you have decarbonization, you have pressure from customers, from banks, uh, from charters, and then you have all of these regulations uh, that are coming down the pipeline. And so now, you know, suddenly I think that there's a much more openness on the point of, uh, from the perspective of the shipping side, and that helps everything come all together. And I'm just wondering what your views are on this aspect of the shipping side's interest in doing more business with tech startups. I believe that interest is growing. When you refer to the charterer side, so this is the the, uh, the company or entity that uh, that books a, a vessel for moving cargo from point A to point B. Really, it's a uh, it's analogous to the shipper in many other uh, freight transportation segments. So shippers have traditionally been the ones to drive innovation when it comes to technology because. The transportation element is one cost component in a much larger supply chain, uh, whether you think of it as the commodity trading, profit and loss, or uh, simply delivering the cargo uh, to their end customer for further processing in, say, industrial processes where you've got very valuable assets which need to be operating at a high uptime and require feedstock uh, or raw materials in order to process the materials they create. So. Um, I think that shipping maritime tech has been no different in that many of the shippers or charters have been pushing technology. Um, but this confluence of pressures whereby we're seeing uh, ship owners are, are challenged to find uh, funding for ship finance. Uh, commodity traders, you've seen a lot of banks in Europe and the Far East that pulled back from providing commodity trade finance recently due to a number of high profile uh, uh, mistakes and losses. So because you've got uh, uh, all of this pressure on you, the companies are looking inward and saying, well, how do we compete better? How do we deliver better service to our customers? And technology is an area where there's opportunity to optimize your operations in terms of uh, making better decisions and deriving better insight from your activities, as well as more simple business process automation where you can manage more volumes of goods with the same number of people. Yeah, and on the environmental side, uh, you know, just as a bit of background, the International Mar Maritime Organization has uh, set decarbonization targets for 2000 and 2000, 2030 and 2050. And I think that, you know, most of those targets are going to have to be met uh, with a new kind of fuel use and a new kind of ship design. So, um, but, more immediately, uh, there are uh, agreements such as the sea cargo charter among the charters and the Poseidon principles among the shipping banks. And what these agreements do uh, is the signatories uh, are looking at their portfolios from the perspective of the IMO targets. And so this is going to incentivize uh, shipping to embrace solutions quicker. And then on top of that, last October, 
the International Maritime Organization uh, uh, agreed to uh, shorter term measures. One was called the Energy Efficiency Existing Ship Index uh, to reduce the carbon intensity on the hardware side and the carbon intensity indicator uh, to reduce the intensity on their operational side. So if you put all these things together, there seems like uh, this is a good pitch uh, for a startup, a VC-backed startup to say you to, you know, to a ship owner, hey, we can help you meet these targets. Does that make sense? Absolutely, Greg. What, what we're seeing is that there's a huge influx in interest and activity uh, among any of the existing tech companies and several startups, several of whom we see pop up literally almost every week, focusing on looking at how to help uh, calculate your emissions, reduce those emissions, uh, measure your voyage performance, and help you benchmark how to reduce uh, your, your overall cost and your footprint. You know, one of the things that's interesting, because we've taken a deep dive into ESG, and one of the things we found was that generally it's hard to have uh, enforcement uh, or compliance mechanisms in place. So it's, it's easy to come up with a framework, but harder to get industries to embrace it. But what we've seen with uh, Poseidon Principles is several of the leading maritime finance uh, banks have said, we want to understand how your vessels are performing, and then they're reporting that internally, which is this is the performance of the uh, uh, of the fleet that we're financing, and this is our environmental impact. And so all of a sudden, when uh, the environmental performance of your ship can affect whether or not you can get financing, uh, we're seeing many owners saying, well, we need to un understand this. And you know, one, one of the points I should take a step back and say is that it's not that ship owners uh, aren't looking at performance, right? We have very experienced people. This is a hard industry to be in. You've got people with decades of experience, naval architects, engineers, who are constantly looking at how to improve how these assets are running. What we're saying is to augment that expert uh, experience with technology that provides better insights or even using artificial intelligence and machine learning to help identify patterns in new insights that might be available tied to overall fleet trading patterns or seasonality and so on. So um, it's, uh, it's not that this is a rock that hasn't been uh, looked under in the industry by any means, but rather what we're doing is we're seeing new technologies coming in that are looking to unlock new value. Um, but I believe that Poseidon principles on the financing side and absolutely the sea cargo charter on the, uh, on the chartering and and and, uh, uh, and freight side, are absolutely changing the game uh, in terms of putting a prerequisite among companies. If you're going to do business with the world's largest charters, uh, moving you know cargo for for call it the Exxon's and Chevron's of the world uh, on the oil side, or the you know ADMs and Cargills of the world on the dry bulk side, then you absolutely have to be prepared to show how your vessel's performing. Um, and I, I, yeah, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, sort of the challenges. I mean, uh, startups talk about TAM or total addressable market. Uh, and if you look at world trade, it's massive. It seems like it would be a massive TAM. Uh, but in reality, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the shipping TAM is segregated. There's different regions. There's, uh, you know, every company does business differently. Uh, there's different sectors. Uh, and there's also just a lot of competition out there from, you know, uh, third party providers, you know, for example, on the voyage management side, you have someone like Vessen, who's been around forever. Uh, you have, um, you know, shipping companies themselves that are doing this. You have charters themselves that are doing this. So uh, that I'm just wondering whether, I mean, the TAM may not be as big as some people think, and that may be a challenge. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, what you, what you, what your thoughts are on, sort of the, the limitations to the TAM? Uh, from my experience, it's very important to understand which segments uh, you're, you're going after if you're a startup. So uh, there's a difference in how ship owners operate if they have an oil tanker versus a dry cargo ship versus a container ship and so on. So uh, in terms of the TAM, uh, it's very challenging. Uh, I, I think it's easy to put on paper 
that there is a very large addressable market by simply counting the number of ships and the total millions of tons of world trade. But in fact, what you tend to find is that you'll have regional clusters of experience, relationships. So startups may flourish in one part of Europe, but have a harder time building a footprint elsewhere. Uh, so you've got regional competition uh, that's hard to overcome at times. Uh, and then also the segmentation based on the type of cargo the ships move. They have very different uh, operations, very different sets of customers. So I think the successful companies are going to find ways to arc across these segments and not just be in, say, one main cargo area, uh, but rather deal across bulk cargoes. And I think one of the other big challenges, uh, particularly with, with international shipping, is uh, CAC or cost of customer acquisition. I mean, this is a global business. Uh, it, it, it takes a lot of uh, money and effort uh, to make yourselves known to people around the world. Uh, and one of the suggestions there is that that makes it more important than ever sort of to team up uh, with someone who's already in the business. But what, what are your thoughts on the CAC aspect of this? Yes, I'm a strong believer that... Uh that the CAC or cost of customer acquisition is very high in maritime tech. Um, it's just a challenge whereby historically uh, customers in the, in the market uh, want to see you, want to, want to understand what service you can deliver on uh, before they'll embrace new technology. Uh, so we've seen various initiatives around trying to reduce the CAC, but ultimately for the new ventures coming into the market, I think without having either some strategic collaboration partners or having a, a, a sort of uh, call it the unfair advantage in the universe. It's uh, it's hard to find how you can overcome that very high CAC without just trying to scale up uh, uh, hiring sales teams or setting up technology that allows customers to trial more efficiently. But it, but it is a market that, from experience, it, it requires interaction with the customers if you're going to win them over. Great. Well, I mean, this has been a this has been a great fireside chat, and I think uh, an important time. You know, maybe twenty twenty one. Maybe this is the moment finally. Um, Evan, uh, if people want to get in touch with you to learn more, uh, how can they reach you? Absolutely. Well, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Evangelos of Stathew. Uh, you can also email me at evan at burmister vogel dot com or evan at skysailadvisors dot com. Uh, always happy to have a conversation about. A maritime tech, whether it's for people thinking of coming into our industry, which we're already, always excited having new people coming into the industry, as well as for uh, investors who are trying to just better understand what's happening in the space and ways that they can get involved. Because uh, we think we're just at the front end and the, the starting point of what's going to be a very exciting journey here. Yeah, this, uh, and I'm, I'm sure I will be in touch uh, for articles in the future. Uh, but thank you again, Evan. Thank you very much for having me, Greg, and thank you, Great Waves.